Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metropolis Radio. Today, we are looking at Brandon Lee's last movie, The Crow. Now, it's no secret that the success of Tim Burton's Batman from 1989 spawned a lot of copycats shortly after that release, but it also brought these types of properties to light as well. So the question on the table is, does this movie work as its own entity, or is it too similar to Tim Burton's Batman for its own good? Now, before we get started, make sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're watching this on to stay notified of new uploads, and also subscribe to the official blog, metropolisradio.blogspot.com, to get the corresponding write-up to this video, along with the PDFs of my presentation files. Anyway, guys, let's get right into The Crow. As always with these retrospectives, we always start off with the creative team. Now, this movie was based on a comic by the same name created by James Obar. It was a cult hit back when it first published in 1989, and it has remained a cult hit ever since. Currently, the comic is being published by IDW. The screenplay was written now by two different writers, the first being John Shirley, who wrote three episodes of the Robocop TV series from 88, and an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine called Visionary. The second being David J. Show, who wrote Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Critters 3, he was also one of the writers for Critters 4, and an episode of The Outer Limits, uh, the 1990 series, called uh, Corner of the Eye. Now, this movie was directed by Alex Proyas. Most of you might know him as the director of I, Robot and Knowing. He also recently did Gods of Egypt with Gerard Butler. Personally, I actually like Alex Proyas' movies, with the exception of Gods of Egypt. So with the creative team out of the way, let's get right into the aesthetics of the movie. With regards to the aesthetics of The Crow, I'm just going to get this right out of the way. This was a definite product of its time. A uh, very dark atmosphere, lack of any real visual detail. Basically, they ripped the aesthetics straight from Tim Burton's Batman. Uh, the primary hero hides, behind, hides his face behind white face paint and black mascara. If Branley's hero had been any longer to cover his entire face, he honestly would have looked like a Japanese ghost in this movie. Um, now, we can't ignore that this is Brandon Lee's last movie, like I said in the intro. Uh, this is the one that he died making. As a result, some of the scenes had to be darker, like the sequence of him running along the rooftops after his resurrection, or him going back to his old apartment to account for Brandon's death. It's obvious that Brandon's body double had to take over to finish filming. The scenes that were shot posthumous are very well known, and the tell is, is you can't see Brandon's face at all in these moments. It's either his face completely dark, or it's a first-person camera view. Now, talking about the score, I really wish that the score to the movie was more heavy metal-based instead of a mixture between orchestral, gospel, and metal, since the main character of the movie, before he's resurrected, is in a metal band. That way, the music can not only be character consistent, but also match the darker tone and lack of visual quality to the movie. So my overall score for the aesthetics is a 3 out of 10. Next up in our retrospectives on here is us talking about the story slash plot of the movie. Now, this movie has a very simple story. It's basically a revenge tale. A group of thugs rape and murder a girl along with her boyfriend on October 30th. A year goes by, the boyfriend gets resurrected to enact his revenge on those who raped and killed his girlfriend. Actually, his fiance at the time, I apologize for that. The way he gets his revenge is to go around and kill the, the thugs who committed the crime. Now, the problem with simple plots is when you try to introduce something more complex, like the boardroom slash round table later on in the movie... The revenge is on the street thugs, not really the mafia guys at the top. I think the only reason that they really got involved is because the last guy ran into the room for protection. It then led to the shootout scene with the boardroom that actually killed Brandon Lee while filming it. And it's just really thrown in there for no other reason than to give our hero more villains to fight. Again, it's a simple story, but I think it's really effective for this type of movie. So my final overall score for it is a 7 out of 10. It's no Shakespeare, it's no Hamlet, but it's mindless fun. Now we move on to our character analysis of this retrospective. So first up, we have Eric Draven, who is our hero of the story. That, that's the crow. Um, and then Shelly, who is Eric's fiance. Um, she's only really brought up in flashbacks and in the very beginning of the movie when you see the rape and killing of her. Then there's Sarah, who's the girl that Eric and Shelly were taking care of. Um, she does come back and help Eric Draven after his resurrection. And then we have one of the coolest characters in the movie, which is Albrecht, 
who was the beat cop who responded to the crime, who told Sarah about Eric and Shelley's murder. And the cool part about it is he is played by Winston Zenimore himself, Ernie Hudson. Now, the characters are well written for a movie like this. So my final overall score for this section is a solid 7 out of 10. Now we've hit the final part of our retrospective, and that's what is the rewatch value that The Crow holds? Now, I do believe that this movie is highly rewatchable despite the issues with the aesthetics and the plot. This is the type of movie that really lends itself to rewatchability because of the simplicity of its plot. The plot is basically just kill the motherfuckers that killed you and raped and killed your fiance. That's really all there is to it. And this is the perfect movie to put on if you just want to shut your brain off for an hour and a half. It really doesn't take a whole lot of brain power to figure out what's going on at any given time, which I think is to the movie's benefit and not to its detriment. So the overall score for the rewatch value is a solid 10 out of 10 for me. So what's the final review score that I have given The Crow? My final score for this movie is a 6.5 out of 10. Now, I actually enjoyed this movie despite giving it that score of 6.5 out of 10. I just feel that the aesthetic choices being too close to Batman just can't be ignored. If you like these type of dark superhero movies, then by all means go for it. You might actually enjoy The Crow. If all you like is the Marvel movies with the exception of the Blade series and the Punisher, then you might really not like this. I'm not trying to tell anyone what to, what to not go see or to go see, but do be mindful of what you're getting into.